Hello everyone. I'm Dr. Jerry Jones, CEO and Principal Instructor at Medics of Houston here in Houston, Texas. Today I want to give you a few tips, tricks, and pearls regarding the diagnosis of third degree AV block and AV dissociation. Now first of all, let's be very clear about something. This is not an either-or type of distinction. Since all cases of third-degree AV block involve AV dissociation, the real issue is actually deciding the cause of AV dissociation. AV dissociation is not a primary dysrhythmia like atrial fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. It's always a manifestation of some other process, an uh, electrocardiographic symptom, if you will. AV dissociation can be due to a problem with the sinus node resulting in bradycardia, the AV node, the Hisperkinji system, various automatic rhythms, parasystole, or most importantly, third degree AV block. Let's look at this lead to rhythm strip. Is this third degree AV block or AV dissociation without block? What do we look for in third degree AV block? First of all, as everyone knows, we look for a rhythm in which there's no association between P waves and QRS complexes. Unfortunately, that's really about all most people know, and you know what? It, it really doesn't help, but I'll note it on your screen anyway. You know, there you are. The next thing we look for in third degree AV block is a slow rhythm. Now, all cases of AV dissociation in third degree AV block have an escape rhythm. There are two possibilities for escape rhythms in AV dissociation, junctional and ventricular. The junctional escape rate ranges from 40 to 60 beats per minute. Ventricular escape rhythm or rate ranges from 20 to 40 beats per minute. The escape rhythm during a third degree AV block is precisely regular. It's mathematically precisely regular. It does not vary. There are no early beats. There are no premature beats. Such beats would indicate AV to conduction, and that would automatically rule out any third degree AV block. So you're not going to find that in an AV dissociation caused by third degree AV block. The third requirement for diagnosing a third degree AV block is that you need to see P waves in areas of diastole where there's no reason for them not to conduct yet they still fail to conduct. Non-conducting P waves located in places where one wouldn't even think that they would begin to conduct, regardless of the underlying rhythm, don't prove anything. We're going to see an example of that in, in just a moment. Now, let's see how our rhythm strip here relates to these criteria. First of all, we see that there appears to be no real association between the P waves and the Q waves. Now, that really doesn't help except to tell us that AV dissociation is present. It says nothing about whether this AV dissociation is due to AV block or not. And uh, again, all cases of third degree AV block include AV dissociation. So the, this, this symptom here, this finding of uh, P waves and QRS complexes that are unrelated don't really help us in distinguishing between the two. Now, there's a junctional rhythm present. The QRS complexes are narrow, they're normal appearing, and they're totally unassociated with any P waves. So this is a junctional escape rhythm. Let's measure the rate, and I've got some on-screen calipers here. Let's measure the ventricular rate, the junctional escape rhythm rate and we see that it is about 51 beats per minute okay now that's well within the range for a junctional escape rhythm uh, the P waves the atrial rate is going to be let's see here about 43 beats per minute so the atrial rate is lower than the ventricular rate, the junctional escape rhythm. Um, we have to measure two rates here. You know, when anyone hands you a, a 12 lead ECG or a rhythm strip and they ask you what the rate is, 
that's a trick question. There's always two rates, not just one. You always have an atrial rate and a ventricular rate when you're analyzing a 12 lead ECG or especially a rhythm strip. Okay, let's move that out of the way for a moment. Now, when we look at the P waves individually, yeah, this one here, 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 here. We're not going to worry about this one down here because it's kind of cut off. But when we look at them individually, we see that all of them basically have appeared in areas where they would not be able to conduct under any circumstances except for one. This one right here. But let's, let's go over why these would not conduct. This P wave right here doesn't even get fully inscribed on the tracing before an escape beat interrupts it, so it runs into refractory tissue. This P wave right here comes so quickly after the QRS complex, it too runs into refractory tissue and cannot conduct past the AV node or junction. We'll skip this one for the moment. This one right here, again, it is barely inscribed before a um, uh, junctional escape beat occurs. So obviously this impulse here, the P wave, has not had a chance to get down into the junction yet where the pacemaker is. The pacemaker still fired and once it fired it left the tissue in the junction refractory and this P wave could not conduct any further. Again this P wave is so close to the QRS complex it too has run into refractory tissue most likely in the junction. But that leaves us with this P wave right here. This is a P wave superimposed on the upslope of this T wave. The first hump is the peak of the T a P wave. The second hump is the peak of the T wave. This P wave has occurred later than this one and this one. And it has occurred late enough so that it found the tissues in the AV node and the junction able to conduct. Uh, the, those tissues are receptive to conduction. Now, it may have found them in their relative refractory period because this PR interval looks like it's going to be at right at the upper limit of normal, if not maybe a, a little bit more. It's probably going to be around 0.22 seconds. But the little bit of delay it encountered in the AV node and or junctional area has given the ventricles time to fully repolarize. And so once this impulse makes it through the AV node and junction, which it does, then it's able to depolarize the ventricles normally. And so we get a normal appearing narrow QRS complex here. Okay. Now, here's a little pearl for you. When I first looked at this tracing, and I mean the very instant I looked at it, I knew it could not be third degree block, third degree AV block. I knew it positively and with complete confidence. Now, how did I know that? I knew it because of this beat right here. Now, I told you that all third degree AV block includes AV dissociation. But there are a couple of differences between an AV dissociation that's part of third degree AV block and all other AV dissociations. And let's take a look at that. Let me kind of move this out of the way. There we go. Okay. The first difference is that when third degree AV block is present, there's no possibility of a capture beat making its way into the rhythm. The escape rhythm will remain precisely and mathematically regular. There will be no early beats in an AV dissociation caused by a third degree AV block. Now in AV dissociation that is not caused by third degree AV block, the heart still retains the ability to conduct from the atria to the ventricles and usually at some point it'll do so. Therefore AV dissociation not caused by third degree AV block may have an occasional irregularity in the rhythm caused by an early capture beat. Now the second difference is that the ventricular rhythm in third degree AV block will always be an escape rhythm, usually around 50 beats or less, 50 beats per minute or less. The atrial rate 
will be faster than the ventricular rate. However, the ventricular rhythm in an AV dissociation not caused by third degree AV block isn't always an escape rhythm. It can be an accelerated idiojunctional or idioventricular rhythm or a ventricular tachycardia, all of them faster than the atrial rate. When an escape rhythm is present in AV dissociation not caused by third degree AV block, it may be rather slow, but the atrial rate is going to be even slower. Now, there is an exception to this rule, but I'm going to save it for an advanced tutorial. We don't have to be concerned with it because it's, it's rather rare. So, the next time you encounter an ECG or a rhythm strip with a fairly slow rate in what appears to be a lack of association between the P waves and the QRS complexes, don't immediately jump to conclusions. What you see is AV dissociation. But you know what? You really don't know anything more than that. Look for P waves that should have conducted but didn't. If you only have a 12 lead ECG, have someone run a long, long rhythm strip. You want to see P waves in several parts of diastole. Diastole on the ECG being between the end of the T wave and the beginning of the QRS complex. But anyway, you want to see P waves in several parts of diastole that fail to conduct when they should have conducted. Are there any early escape beats? If so, then you've confidently ruled out third degree AV block right then and there. Now, before I finish, I have two more pearls for you. First, a capture beat must be early. The QRS of the capture beat must fall before the next escape beat. The RR interval from the QRS of the capture beat to the preceding QRS must be shorter than the RR interval of the escape rhythm. Okay, the early beat in the middle of an escape rhythm is a capture beat and it indicates that there is AV conduction and third degree AV block is not present. I repeat, not present. Second, the capture beat only has to be early. It doesn't have to be very early. Now, often when the escape rate is slow, a capture beat may not, uh, may not be noticeably early, but it will carry the same significance. Okay. The rhythm, this is very important, the rhythm may look very regular to your eye but you should use ECG calipers to make sure one of the beats isn't a bit early. It could mean the difference between getting a pacemaker placed or just having some medication adjusted. Well that's all for this tutorial. I hope you learned something important today. At Medicus of Houston we produce live four-day boot camps in advanced ECG interpretation and complex dysrhythmia analysis. Now, these courses are mainly for non-cardiologists who simply want to take their ECG interpretation skills to a much higher level. Now, cardiologists are not excluded. We've had several cardiologists in our classes. But our participants include not only physicians, but nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and PhD researchers. Each class is limited to just 10, uh, 10 participants, and you spend up to 14 hours during those four days actually interpreting real ECGs during the class while being guided by experts. Now, our students come from all over the world, so our classes tend to fill early. You can learn more about uh, our courses by watching our explanatory video, which gives you more information about our approach to teaching and available discounts on tuition. Just click on the link below the, uh, below the video in the text and uh, the web address showing right now on the video will take you directly to the home page of our website. For Medicus Houston, I'm Dr. Jerry Jones. I hope to see you in one of our classes very soon. Good day.